Michael uh, Teitelbaum is a, um, has a distinguished resume, which you will find along with the others. He's spoken on the subject of insurance coverage for professionals on a number of other occasions and is here this afternoon to talk to us about the interrelationship of professional misconduct and insurance coverage. Michael, thank you. Thanks very much, Herman. Uh, I, uh, I think you all have my uh, paper and I won't uh, go through uh, what's in my paper. What I thought I'd do this afternoon is expand on one of the areas in the paper and in particular something I think that's important both with respect to when we as lawyers are defending a claim against a professional or when we've brought a claim against a professional and that's the question of duty to defend. Now before I get into that there are a couple of things I wanted to mention. First of all there's the question of uh, and we've focused I think a great deal on disciplinary proceedings today uh, whether there's any possibility of getting insurance coverage for that. And I think the, the short answer to that is that um, subject to what your specific policy is with respect to uh, the coverage a professional is granted, there is no coverage for disciplinary proceedings. You're going to have to uh, handle that yourself, unfortunately. The policy, and I'm thinking in particular, for example, of the lawyer's professional indemnity company policy, responds to uh, lawsuits with respect to damage claims and not with respect to claims with, um, made in terms of disciplinary uh, complaints. Now, as I say, that's subject to each particular profession and each particular policy because there may well have been the ability to negotiate between the profession and the insurer and the broker that's involved in negotiating a, a policy coverage to extend some sort of coverage with respect to uh, the cost of defense for a disciplinary proceeding, but that depends on the particular case. Now before I move on to dealing specifically with the duty to defend, I want to mention a, an Australian case which has recently attracted some attention. It's a decision of the New South Wales Court of Appeal and it's called East End Real Estate Property Limited trading as city living against C.E. Heath Casualty and General Insurance Limited, 25 New South Wales Law Reports, 400. It's a 1991 case and it deals with the issue of whether um, relief from forfeiture can be granted with respect to a claims made policy. And you'll see when you have a look at the materials in the um, in the binder that most coverage afforded to professionals is by way of a claims made policy. <clears throat> now the decision by the New South Wales Court of Appeal doesn't contain a comprehensive review of the facts. It does indicate that the appellant was covered for the period of December 31st, 1989 to December 31st, 1990 by a policy of professional indemnity insurance. The coverage indemnified the insured against, quote, any claims for breach of professional duty which shall be first made against the insured within the policy period and which shall be notified to underwriters or their representatives during the period of cover. The policy defined the term claim to mean and include a demand made by a third party against the insured, legal proceedings instituted against the insured, and any circumstance likely to give rise to a claim of which the insured notified the insurer. During the policy period, a claim for breach of professional duty was made against the appellant by a client. About six weeks after the expiration of the coverage period, there was a ju judgment given in favor of the client against the appellant and the appellant then notified the insurer of the claim and sought indemnity under the policy. The insurer denied there was any entitlement to recover and the appellant instituted a claim against the insurer. At first instance, on the trial of the issue of whether the insurer 
was entitled to deny liability simply because it was notified of the claim outside the coverage period, the judge hearing this question found in favor of the insurer and dismissed the appellant's action. The appellant relied upon section 54 of what's called the Insurance Contracts Act, which appears to be broader than the relief from forfeiture section of the Insurance Act in Ontario. The relevant portion of section 54.1 of the Insurance Contracts Act read, where the effect of a contract of insurance would, for this sec but for this section, be that the insurer may refuse to pay a claim either in whole or in part by reason of some act of the insured or of some other person being an act that occurred after the contract was entered into, the insurer may not refuse to pay the claim by reason only of that act, but his liability in respect of the claim is reduced by the amount that fairly represents the extent to which the insurer's interests were prejudiced as a result of that act. By virtue of section 54.6 of the same act, reference to an act includes reference to an omission. A three-member panel heard the appeal and were unanimous in their ruling, although two of the justices, Chief Justice Gleason and Justice of Appeal Mahoney, each gave reasons. Essentially, the Chief Justice, whose reasons were concurred in by the third judge, found that the legislation intended to provide relief in these circumstances, notwithstanding the nature of the policy coverage. The Chief Justice stated, in the case of a policy of professional indemnity insurance, there may be a condition obliging the insured promptly to notify all claims received, or as in the present case, the insurance may be expressed to cover only claims that are not only received, but also notified during a particular period. He then went on and said, in my view, by choosing the words of generality and avoiding reference to the particular type of contractual provision that might produce the result that the insurer may refuse to pay a claim, the legislature has evinced an intention to avoid the result, uh, the result that the operation of Section 54 depends upon matters of form. It is perfectly appropriate to say in the present case that the effect of the contract of insurance is such that, but for Section 54, the respondent may refuse to pay the appellant's claim. The circumstance that this comes about because of the language of that part of the contract of insurance which defines the risk rather than by reason of a breach of a condition of the policy does not seem to me to be material. Mr. Justice Mahoney, in his reasons, stated that he finds difficulty in seeing why, in remedial legislation of the kind that Section 54.1 is, Parliament should provide relief in respect of acts and omissions of the insured related to conditions or exclusions, but not acts or omissions relevant to the extent of the cover. If the nature of the mischief to be remedied by the action can be stated briefly, it was to ensure that that insurance, which would otherwise be available, should not be lost as the result of the kinds of acts or omissions of the insured to which Section 54 refers. If the mischief be of such a kind, it would exist whether the act or omission went to cover or to conditions or exclusions. It has not been suggested in this case that functionally the operations of insurance require such a distinction. Now, this last statement seems to suggest that there's no rationale for requiring claims to be reported during the policy period, even though this is the foundation of a claims made policy. The requirement that a claim be reported during the policy period is to permit certainty for an insurer so that it will know what claims it's facing. This decision and the McNish case in Ontario, which is cited in, in the written materials, effectively removes this certainty and with it, one of the purposes of a claims made policy. Moreover, the court doesn't address the issue of prejudice for which the section provided. It may be that this point was not before the court, but based on the facts, one would think that reporting a claim after judgment has been obtained constitutes prejudice to the insurer. 
an application for leave to appeal to the Australian High Court was filed in the East End case, and we understand that the application wasn't granted. It remains to be seen whether these cases are a trend that eventually renders claims made policies ineffective. Now, I'd like to turn then to the duty to defend and expand a little bit on the comments that I made about that in my paper. The Supreme Court of Canada's decision in Nichols and American Home held that the duty to defend is broader and independent of the duty to indemnify. However, it is not so broad that it arises with respect to allegations which are clearly beyond the scope of the policy coverage. Normally, when confronted with the refusal to defend by an insurer, a court will look to the statement of claim of the claimant against the insured to determine whether any allegations against the insured come within the coverage under the policy. If so, the insurer will be under an obligation to defend those allegations which may come within coverage. If there is no allegation which, if proven, would trigger coverage, as in Nichols, then there's no duty to defend. The situation, however, becomes more problematic where some of the allegations may be within coverage and some are clearly not. The Honourable Madam Justice McLaughlin in Nichols expressed her view of the current practice in the situation where claims are made against the insured, some of which fall within and some without of coverage, and, say, and said that the insurer will defend only those claims within the coverage and call on the insured to retain his or her own counsel to assist in the defense of claims which are outside of the policy coverage. Although it may be clear that an insurer need only defend claims which come within coverage, it remains to be determined how parties will deal with the logistics of the defense between the insurer and the insured. Various considerations arise when wrestling with the problem and I propose to deal with one of them this afternoon, which is the case where there are actual or apparent conflicts of interest between the positions of the insurer and the insured. The Nichols case addresses a situation in which there's no coverage for any portion of the claim. Different considerations may apply where there is an actual conflict in the interests between the insurer and the insured. The situation will most often arise in the case where the insured is sued in the alternative for both an intentional act and for negligence. Three cases decided before Nichols in 1988 address the issue of coverage where there was such a conflict and might now have a different result, but they're the ones that are still in existence and have, there's no further ones that have really touched on the issue, so we'll have a brief look at them. The first one is a case called Laurencine and Jardine, and it's reported at 1988 ILR 1-2292. It's a decision by the Ontario High Court. The plaintiff sued the defendant Jardine for $1.5 million, arising out of a motor vehicle accident in which Laurencine was injured while riding a motorcycle owned by the defendant Jardine. The defendant, Halifax, had a policy of insurance on the motorcycle, while the third party, Wellington Insurance, was the insurer under a homeowner's policy on the household of Margaret Jardine, with whom Michael Jardine lived. There was an issue as to whether the vehicle was driven by Laurencine with the consent of Jardine. The Halifax sought but was unsuccessful in having Jardine execute a non-waiver agreement. Thereafter, both insurers refused to defend the lawsuit. On motion by Jardine, Mr. Justice Gray ordered that the Halifax was obligated to defend Jardine and to pay his solicitor client costs of the proceeding to date. Jardine then moved for an order allowing him to appoint solicitors of his own choosing to represent him in the lawsuit and to have conduct of the defense in the main action. He further sought an order directing that the defendant, Halifax, be responsible for the payment of all legal fees and disbursements of the solicitors appointed by him. The court found that in those circumstances in which solicitors appointed by the Halifax are defending him, 
the insured will be required to speak to counsel and advise of all surrounding circumstances and conversations which took place before and at the time the plaintiff left Jardine's residence with the motorcycle. The court felt that it may, it may very well be something said by Jardine in those conversations with that counsel that would be the cornerstone of Halifax's defense. The court reviewed the applicable law, mostly American cases, and found that there was an appearance of impropriety in this case. It was held that Jardine was entitled to appoint his own solicitors to defend him in the action, and such solicitors would be paid by the Halifax. Based on American authorities, I think it's fair to say that a conflict of interest exists if an insurer reserves its rights because of coverage questions which depend upon findings as to the insured's own conduct. For example, if the policy excludes fraudulent but covers negligent acts and a finding at trial of the former will mean that there is no entitlement to indemnity by the insurer. However, if the reservation of rights is based on coverage disputes which have nothing to do with the issues being litigated in the underlying action, then there's no conflict of interest requiring independent counsel. For example, the insured's failure to promptly report the claim against it if this is the subject of an exclusion as opposed to a, a condition in the policy. In light of the Nichols decision, I think it's questionable whether Laurencine is still good law. It doesn't appear that the Supreme Court of Canada was willing to go so far as to say that where the insurer proposes to defend under a reservation of rights, then the insured is entitled to choose separate defense counsel and have that cost paid by the insurer. Even more problematic is where the insured is sued in the alternative for damage caused by an intentional act, such as fraud or assault, and then also for negligence. In those circumstances, an insured has been held to be entitled to a separate defense. There's a case called Schwartz v. Ross, which is reported at 1988 ILR 1-2352, decision by the then Ontario District Court, where the pleadings disclose that the plaintiff went to the defendant's residence in response to complaints made by the defendant with respect to a hearing aid that he had purchased from the plaintiff's employer. The meeting became unfriendly and the plaintiff tried to depart. Before the plaintiff was able to enter his car, he was shot by the defendant and seriously wounded. In the statement of claim, the plaintiff pleaded alternative theories of liability, being the intentional use of a firearm or the negligent handling of a firearm. The insurance policy under which the defendant was covered contained an exclusion for bodily injury, quote, caused intentionally by you or at your direction. The court held that on the basis of the pleading, there was an obligation to defend. However, the position of the two parties were in conflict. The defendant's insurer, the Wawanisa, was joined to the action by the defendant as a third party. In both the defense to the main action and the defense to the third party action, the Wawanisa alleged that the insured committed the assault and that it was an intentional act. Judge Borens held that the policy obligated the Wawanisa to defend its insured at its own expense. However, his honor didn't feel it was appropriate to grant the alternative relief requested, namely that the insurer be obligated to pay the defendant's cost of defense on a solicitor and client basis. The reason he didn't grant this part of the order was that this was a remedy which had to be determined by a trial judge. Judge Borens appeared to base his reasoning on the fact that this relief arises out of the insurer's anticipated breach of contract in failing to defend the main action. However, his honor's decision seems inconsistent to some extent as he goes on in his reasons to note that he's refusing to grant the alternative relief because a judge must interpret the true nature of the contractual obligation on the part of the insurer to defend the insured for a claim alleging bodily injuries and further to determine whether the contractual obligation requires the insurer to pay the defendant's legal expenses in retaining an independent counsel in circumstances where the insured and the insurer have conflicting defenses in the main action. 
Now, I think my time is running short, so I'll pass over the, the last case, except to just tell you the, the citation so you can have a look at it uh, when you have the opportunity. And it, the, the, the third case is called Goss v. Hugh Miller, and its citation is 1988 ILR 1-2372. Now, the present practice appears to be with respect to duty to defend that where some allegations are within and some allegations are outside of coverage and there is no actual or apparent conflict, then on the basis of Nichols, the insurer will appoint counsel to defend the claims within coverage and the insured's own counsel must defend those outside coverage. Nichols did not, however, address the situation where there is actually a conflict of interest. The court appears to invite the insurer and the insured to arrive at an agreement with respect to the provision of and payment for a defense. As discussed in my paper, when the parties fail to reach such an agreement, the point still requires final determination by the Canadian courts. If all else fails, it appears likely that the courts will hold that an insured is entitled to appoint his or her own counsel to be paid by the insurer when conflicts such as these occur, but we'll have to see if that in fact is what actually happens. Under errors and omissions or claims made policies, these questions arise constantly. Lawyers, accountants, and real estate agents, to take three examples, are often sued in both fraud and negligence, and the procedure to follow in such circumstances must be resolved between the insurer and the insured. Absent an agreement between the insurer and the insured as to the manner in which the action is to be defended, the insurer may appoint counsel to defend the entire matter, thereby acknowledging its duty to defend, while reserving its rights to, re to refuse indemnity and to seek recovery of the defense costs if ultimately a court finds that the insured acted in a manner that wasn't covered by the policy. The insured is always advised that in those circumstances, he or she should consult a personal solicitor for advice with respect to those claims that are not covered under the policy. I hope this has helped to illuminate the duty to defend to some extent for you, and I thank you all for your kind attention. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Our, um our next speaker, speaker is um, now known as the Honorable Robert Reed. Uh, for many of us, it's hard to stop calling him Justice Reed. Um, there was an oblique reference earlier. All right. It's quite simple. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there was an oblique reference today to the concept when the divisional court was set up that it was to be a full-time court of specialists. For many of us, uh, we thought it was to be Bob Reed's court. And uh, years of practice in that court really consisted of trying to find out when he was going to be there and to try to schedule your cases when he arrived. Um, undoubtedly, the preeminent author on administrative law in the province of Ontario, Canada. Um, Robert Reed now practices as counsel with Toplitsky Colson. And, and I have a note here somewhere that says you now chair, co chair the hearing committee of the Toronto Stock Exchange. Your chance to get back. Thank you, Robert Reed. <clears throat> Thank you, Herman. I'm glad that your <clears throat> sentence, which gave me a little bit of, bit of apprehension when you embarked on it, came out quite the way it did. I thought you were going to say, and scheduled cases when he wasn't there. Um, I am going to stay within the uh, instructions that I was given. I was uh, requested to uh, deal with and I quote from my instructions, judicial attitudes towards appeals from peer reviews, scope of the appeal or judicial review remedy, and pause, practical advice on how to be successful in court. <laughs> I hope I can fulfill the first two obligations. I'm going to try to fulfill the last, but um, that's really up to you. There's not much I can do except try. 
But the title demands that I concentrate on disciplinary procedure, so I won't be touching the civil aspect of uh, professional uh, life. A few truisms to begin with. Uh, there are, of course, two ways of uh, challenging the decisions of professional dis disciplinary bodies in court. One is by way of an appeal, the other by way of judicial review. Another truism on top of that, and that is that you are normally required by the court uh, to proceed by way of an appeal if an appeal has been provided uh, before you seek judicial review. That is a general rule. It is almost always followed, but there are very exceptional circumstances in which the court will permit a challenge by way of judicial review if the issue goes to the heart of the jurisdiction of the tribunal. The argument is uh, simply that it is not necessary to wait until the tribunal has completed its, uh, its business or uh, it's not even necessary to stand by while it embarks if there's a reasonable prospect of showing that it shouldn't have started at all. But apart from that, uh, your first uh, opportunity, your first source of redress uh, is, of course, an appeal. Um, another truism that is that uh, appeals are, in effect, created by statute. There's no such thing as a common law appeal. Uh, judicial review looks like it, and it wouldn't be a bad way to describe a judicial review as a common law appeal if it were not for the fact that the courts insist that there is a substantial difference between these two uh, procedures. So first of all, you will look in the statute uh, which establishes the tribunal you're concerned with, and we're thinking uh, in this context of disciplinary tribunals. And you will normally find an appeal uh, from the tribunal in that statute. That is to say, if there is going to be one, it's probably to be found there. There are some rare occasions on which uh, an appeal is provided uh, in a different statute than the one that establishes the tribunal. Uh, I'll add those examples to this paper when it is published. Uh, but by and large, you don't have to worry about that. So now you have found that there is an appeal provision and uh, yet another truism, the powers of the reviewing court, what the court can do on appeal uh, are as set out uh, in the statute. Uh, the word appeal by itself uh, is uh, ambiguous first thing that one asks is, what do you mean by an appeal? We don't have the same problem with respect to proceedings at trial. Where an appeal is provided from a trial decision, then it almost always follows that that gives the appeal court the opportunity to review any aspect of what has gone on at trial and uh, to uh, intervene if it uh, thinks it necessary. Uh, in, any, in any way. The significant difference uh, between that kind of broad appeal and an appeal which is sometimes much narrower and defined in much narrower terms is that in the first case, the court is entitled to look at the merits and not just at some aspect of the procedure. You will find appeals, and in, indeed in Herman's uh, paper, you will find a number of uh, statutes uh, which provide for appeals. And if you look at those statutory provisions, you will find that they range uh, from the narrow type of appeal uh, on a question of, uh, of law uh, to um, the broadest possible type of appeal, which permits the court uh, to look at all aspects of the matter <clears throat> and indeed to substitute its opinion uh, for the tribunal on the merits of the case. So you will know how to uh, uh, frame your appeal 
uh, when you see what kind of courts, uh, the, what kind of power the court has, and you will know what uh, order to try to obtain uh, when you know that. The uh, law side of our Canada Act uh, have provides for an appeal from the disciplinary proceedings to the divisional court. In this case, uh, the appeal is, simply provides that the appeal court, in this case the divisional court, uh, may make such order as the court considers proper. Uh, it's not confined in any way, and that gives it a full uh, range of uh, the usual appeal powers. Um, I've said that you will have to uh, appeal first, uh, normally, but if there is no appeal provided, then um, you will have to resort to uh, judicial review. Now, whether judicial review is the means of your approaching the court or an appeal, uh, you will run into some general attitudes that uh, reviewing courts uh, have expressed, and in some cases repeated tediously. Uh, in some cases, they say it all the time, every time they deal with a matter that has come up from a professional disciplinary tribunal. And that expresses uh, caution uh, and respect for the uh, tribunal itself, respect for the profession that the tribunal seeks to uh, help to govern. Uh, but basically a reluctance to intervene in the governance of the affairs of professional bodies. You find that over and over again, and in the, uh, in the blatant uh, self-advertising handout that uh, you will have called uh, Reed's Administrative Law, which consists of uh, cases from the database which we use in publishing that uh, excellent uh, periodical, uh, you will find, um, and, and this is just, this is not selected on any other basis that they just happen to be the cases that we've collected in the year or so that we've been in this business. There are other statements, uh, but uh, this kind of thing tends to be said over and over again, and it was not said more forcibly than in a recent decision in the Supreme Court of Canada called Perlman, which you'll find as number 548 in the, uh, the uh, handout. Uh, the court said, in the case at Bar, the Manitoba legislature has spoken, and spoken clearly. The Law Society Act manifestly intends to leave the governance of the legal profession to lawyers, and unless judicial intervention is clearly warranted, this expression of the legislative will ought to be respected. Uh, another case you'll find there called Holt uh, repeats the uh, uh, ever uh, uh, tedious uh, statement of the court uh, that the peer review uh, will not uh, be lightly interfered with by the court. In Wilkinson, which was a case that uh, involved the uh, Securities Commission, um, it was decided that um, only where there was a plain, well, it involved the uh, Toronto Stock Exchange rather than the Securities Commission, but they, the court said that they would intervene only where there was a plain and vital mistake. And this deference uh, really underlies the court's approach uh, to appeals against uh, disciplinary decisions. And anyone challenging a decision should be aware that it is there. But let not that uh, suggest that the court will not intervene where it sees fit to do so. And um, the judges have intervened over the years and in some cases pretty drastically. So they do it respectfully, but they do it one way or the other. There are two general areas uh, which support uh, intervention. One is procedural unfairness, and if you were seeking to uh, have the court intervene uh, in the procedure, it will be on probably on that ground. It could be uh, on a slightly different ground, uh, which comes closer to the exercise of its jurisdiction. In other words, if they, if they fail to follow their own rules of procedure, you could call that uh, jurisdictional error or error of law rather than procedural uh, unfairness. But basically, procedural unfairness is the, almost the typical basis for intervention. And then legal error is the other one, which uh, would include jurisdictional error, 
or uh, uh, some error of law that the court considers to be significant enough that even if it doesn't go to, a, to jurisdiction, it nevertheless requires correction. What do you, uh, uh, well, the procedural errors that have been noticed by courts and have been subject to uh, uh, intervention um, are all pretty well the same as they are with respect to any other tribunal. Administrative law generally uh, deals with uh, process. Process and power are the real uh, issues in administrative law. And the court looks at how a decision was arrived at on judicial review rather than what the decision was. On judicial review, the court is not, or continuously reminds us that it is not, interested in the merits. The court doesn't, is not interested in how the, in what the decision was. It is interested in how it was made. And it looks at the process in terms of fairness uh, and natural justice. And uh, this bill of complaints that uh, you will find uh, uh, is supporting, uh, or, or uh, examples of which you will find in that handout, um, is really not much different than the bill of complaints that is brought uh, commonly uh, against any tribunal. Uh, for instance, an appearance of bias. Uh, I've given you a couple of cases. In the Mohan case, uh, uh, number 409, and the Leshner case, uh, number 1121, these were uh, cases in which either bias, an appearance of bias was established uh, or considered and rejected. The Leshner case uh, um, involved a participation by an official who had the, uh, the uh, obligation to make a decision but who had been involved at an earlier stage in the uh, bureaucratic run-up to the decision, which suggested that uh, the decision would not be an impartial one. In Mohan, a cabinet minister and members of the public uh, wrote to the disciplinary tribunal in support of the doctor whose, uh, whose uh, life was virtually, professional life was at stake. Uh, but uh, uh, unlike uh, the uh, result in uh, Leshner, in Mohan, the court said that uh, they did not see that that uh, really uh, supported uh, and reasonable apprehension of bias. Uh, delay is another one. Uh, that's, again, a common complaint. And you will find uh, that in Harvey, uh, number 898, and Perlman again, and in another one, Duncan, 294, delays have been considered in terms of fairness. And in Duncan, you might be interested to know, the delay was only eight years. It took that length of time for the Law Society to get around to actually trying the guy. And uh, what do you think the result was? I mean, after all, we are all sort of in chancery here, aren't we? And it was found not to be prejudicial. Uh, the rare case where there has been a failure to grant a hearing, in this particular case in McWatt, uh, number 700, even uh, in that case, the statute did not specifically require one. But uh, the uh, court took the view that, that uh, the tribunal um, had uh, misunderstood its function and should therefore give an oral hearing um, and do it again. Um, failure to follow uh, its own uh, procedural rules will lead to a challenge, as in Davis and Hobbs, number 1013, and in McCaw, number 428. Uh, High-handedness on the part of the tribunal towards uh, the counsel uh, involved, or the witnesses, or the parties, um, is a frequent uh, source of complaint. Um, improper intervention by the tribunal itself in the process is another one. Uh, an appearance of arbitrariness, appearance of uh, hurry, appearance of indifference or insincerity uh, sometimes uh, is the basis uh, for an attack. Uh, it would probably have to go further than that, of course, to be successful, but it, it, it provides uh, a fairly common uh, uh, and queasy feeling in the minds of people who are exposed to it. And they uh, frequently manage either to complain to the ombudsman, who, by the way, is getting at the rate of, is getting complaints not all about tribunals, but mostly, 
at the rate of 30,000 a year or to go to the court. Um, one um, hot uh, item that is now emerging in administrative law um, is the extent to which uh, tribunals can rely on counsel's advice. You, there was a recent case uh, here called Kahn, K-A-H-N, K-H-A-N, and that's in the list. By the way, this is listed uh, in reverse chronological order if you're wondering about uh, um, the apparent lack of any order uh, in uh, gathering these uh, cases together. But that just happens to be how our program lists them. And in Kahn, the Court of Appeal um, to many people's surprise, uh, uh, was willing to tolerate the uh, review of a, of a decision, the reasons, uh, the reasons for a decision which had been drafted by the tribunal by an outside lawyer. You have to really read that case to, to uh, be able to, uh, to weigh it against other cases, uh, and there's one called Depre, number 1247. I see Kahn is 1127 in the list. Uh, Depre uh, took a different view. Uh, it's a case decided in the Maritimes at almost the same time as Kahn. And uh, there, someone is going to have to sit down, and I think Gavin is probably in the best position to do it, and explain uh, the difference between these cases. So on the face of things, it looks as if the courts are willing to tolerate an independent counsel or a counsel who is not involved directly in the process of the hearing, let's say, uh, to give advice uh, to the tribunal, but uh, they are very, very much against uh, permitting counsel who have been involved in the process also either giving advice in the course of the reason writing or writing the reasons themselves, something which uh, used to occur fairly frequently in the past. Others would be insufficient notice, or the absence of reasons, or insufficient reasons uh, where reasons are required. Bear in mind that where reasons aren't required, there still is a potential for an, an, for an, an inference to, to be drawn adversely by the court against the tribunal, because the court says, we don't know how you could possibly come to this conclusion. If you'd given us some reasons, we might have understood it. You haven't, therefore we think you couldn't give us any reasons, or you didn't have any reasons. In short, the usual, or, or there may be just simply unacceptable behavior on the part of the tribunal. Uh, we are all aware, as newspaper readers, of some unfortunate occasions that have arisen, particularly in the immigration uh, world, in which uh, tribunal members, uh, obviously unskilled in their task, or unaware of the fact that they were on public display, made derogatory remarks about uh, participants, counsel included, and made the mistake of uh, not only of passing notes, because judge, judges pass notes back and forth all the time, but judges are pretty careful not to put them in a waste paper basket that's available to the, to the parties. Um, the mere occurrence of one or more of these lapses uh, or, some, or disagreement by the court with something that the tribunal has done in the hearing and deciding process might not be sufficient to, to, uh, uh, to persuade the court to intervene. Uh, there are a number of cases in which the court has said, I think they shouldn't have done that. I don't like the way it looks. Uh, I hope they don't do it again. But we're not sure that, we're not persuaded that it has affected the result. The result is a just one. And a, an example, not a really very good example, is Brett, which is number 985. Now, what points can you push? Uh, when you try to get the court to intervene in the uh, process. Well, that, of course, depends on the, the route you have to follow. If you are dealing with it on judicial review, then again, um, you, of course, want the court to be concerned with the merits, and so you, uh, you uh, uh, acquaint them as much with the iniquity of the result as you possibly can. But in order to help you, the court is going to have to find some kind of legal basis, legal error uh, for intervention. And uh, so you can't really simply say, but this is, this is a bad decision given the evidence. That's the merits, and, uh, the and the judicially reviewing courts will keep you off it. You can, however, 
uh, try to establish that there was no evidence uh, to uh, support a finding of fact. And that will be an error uh, justifying intervention. And there's a new concept emerging from the Supreme Court of Canada, and that is an unreasonable conclusion or finding on the evidence. That's coming pretty close uh, to looking at the weight of evidence, which uh, judicial review courts have always refused to, uh, to do. But uh, the, the extent to which this is going to turn judicial review into a broad appeal uh, cannot be decided at this point. And it may be that the Supreme Court of Canada will close the door a little, having opened it rather surprisingly wide with that uh, statement. That statement, however, has been uh, repeated in three different decisions in the Supreme Court of Canada. So I think it's open to you to try to look at the evidence on judicial review to show that there was an unreasonable finding in the light of that evidence. Now, of course, if you're appealing on the basis of, uh, of an error of law, then again, you're not going to be able to, uh, to argue uh, uh, the uh, evidence except uh, to show that there was an error of law. And I would think that an error of law, if it's severe enough, can, could usually be uh, contorted into uh, uh, a procedural error or vice versa, a procedural error can, can sometimes be contorted into a, an error of law if um, you're stuck with a very narrow appeal. Uh, normally, of course, on judicial review, the uh, court won't look at the whole record because, as I say, they're not looking at the merits. Uh, but you could introduce the transcript if there was one available on judicial review um, or, by, or introduce the evidence by way of an affidavit if that's not easy if you're trying to show all of the evidence for the purpose of showing that uh, there was no evidence to support this finding or that uh, the finding was unreasonable. You're up against another hurdle um, when you try to uh, interfere, in, have the court interfere with uh, disciplinary decisions, and that is the standard of proof. This has all also been mentioned in uh, Herman's paper. Uh, courts usually say in one way or the other, in one kind of term or the other, that it is high. And uh, they all say it, uh, it's, it's routine. Where the uh, issue uh, turns one way or the other uh, on the uh, standard of proof that's appropriate. Um, other, many courts have said it in different ways. Uh, they say so, such things as it's more than a balance of probabilities, it's higher than the civil standard, it's at least a fair and reasonable preponderance of the cre credible evidence. That's Maplethorpe and uh, the Alberta Law Society in Estern in the uh, footnotes. It's higher than a balance of probabilities. In Ontario, there's no problem but at all. There is a credo the courts follow. It's called Bernstein. And it was a decision made, I think, in uh, 1975 or so. It's referred to in Herman's paper at page A13. And it says simply that proof must be clear and convincing and based on cogent evidence, which is accepted by the tribunal. Uh, this uh, statement was made in concurring reasons by the late Mr. Justice Garrett. And it has become the uh, creed which uh, the court has followed. You will see it adopted in the case called Akiyumi, uh, case number 1169. Uh, just as an aside, that decision, the Bernstein decision, also holds that the reasons given by the tribunal should set out the standard of proof. And uh, counsel who are acting for tribunals would be wise to remind them of that, because without that, the court might wonder and have a reason for wondering whether they were aware of the standard that applied, which, of course, can be critical um, in these cases. I think it's a little bit difficult, uh, however, to uh, uh, hope that that uh, objective will be realized unless you have the opportunity of uh, participating in the writing of the decision. If you're appearing before the tribunal on the, tri on the tribunal's behalf, of course, you can say, please write this down. Um, but um, otherwise, uh, if it isn't stated, then uh, again, an undue inference uh, can be drawn. And if you're appealing, then that's in your favor. There is, in addition to that uh, standard, 
uh, another concept, and that is of the sliding scale uh, of proof. And in a word, you've, you're probably all familiar with this in other contexts, but it's particularly opposite here uh, in reviews of uh, di disciplinary decisions. The courts take the view that there is a sliding scale and that the standard of proof rises with the severity of the penalty or the potential penalty. So that for a, say, let us say, uh, if a reprimand is what was uh, ordered, then it is possible that the standard of proof uh, will not be required to be very high because the consequences weren't very severe. But where there is uh, an order, for instance, uh, uh, revoking a license to practice medicine, the kind of order that uh, the courts have called professional death, and then the standard of proof will be very high indeed. And that, of, and that of course, is what this uh, very important Bernstein case uh, established. And courts uh, routinely repeat uh, the uh, necessity uh, for observing the high standard of proof and where it's, at, where it's appropriate, the uh, sliding scale. Now, how do you uh, succeed? I'm not going to take, how much time have I got? Five minutes, that's, that's about enough, isn't it? Over, before we lose any more people. Uh, judicial review or appeal of uh, disciplinary decisions is a very, very uncertain thing. Um, I've said that the courts are reluctant to get involved. They will, if they've, but only when really pushed. And so, uh, as earlier speakers have said, get it right first. Try to get, uh, and don't find yourself in default. If you have an objection, get it on the record. Or if there isn't a record running, be able to say later in an affidavit, I objected to that. I objected to that course of conduct, that evidence. Because the court won't be very happy if you, in effect, uh, ambush the uh, tribunal by lying and wait until you get to the court and then say, look at the outrage that was perpetrated on us. The same with a jurisdictional challenge. The court will expect you to put that to the tribunal first. And if you don't do it, then it is, it's theoretically true that you still can do it later because a mistaken assumption of jurisdiction is not a creation of jurisdiction. But even if you're successful in establishing that, you might get licked in costs, and that's not much fun. The penalty that, um, is usually, that usually follows uh, these proceedings, where there is a finding of guilt, um, is the, really the hardest question for the court. Uh, it's, it's hard to argue penalty on judicial review because you're, you're, you're having to show legal error, and it's difficult to show that a particular penalty uh, amounts to an error of law. On an appeal where the court's uh, powers are uh, broad, then of course it's much easier. But you have to think about it from the point of view of the court. Uh, the argument here is that 18 months suspension, my lords, is too much. Well, um, why is it too much? Um, we're talking abstractions here. Too much than what? And uh, so it's uh, very important uh, to be able to compare that with other decisions in similar circumstances. And uh, counsel who are be becoming very, very skilled in this, uh, in this business uh, are now bringing, or were bringing in quite routinely uh, statements uh, probably published in the newsletter published by the uh, professional organization itself, uh, which uh, shows what has happened, uh, this uh, particular penalty was given in this particular set of circumstances. And so the court then gets a basis for reference, much in the way that you try in a criminal trial uh, to offer comparative uh, situations in the hope of being able to guide a judge to come to a reasonable result uh, as to how long a jail sentence should be or something of that type. Uh, if you go in without that, uh, then you have to really uh, rely on the outrage factor. This is, that, that amounts to nothing more than this. My gracious, did they throw that poor person out simply because he did this? And uh, that's, uh, that's sometimes fairly effective. Um, Julian's laughing because it's in, he does it all the time, I'm sure. And, and uh, once you've, uh, 
You know, you have to go home and look at yourself in the mirror and say, did I allow that injustice? I think that's terrible. But uh, lacking that, lacking an ostensibly outrageous uh, a penalty, uh, you better find some other uh, ground for uh, showing that it was inappropriate because the courts routinely say that the matter of uh, penalty is really best left to the tribunal. These people know the profession that they are attempting to uh, help regulate and we won't uh, intervene. Uh, we were not inclined to intervene. Oh no, sometimes they do. There are two very recent decisions. One is Gillen, which just came out of the Court of Appeal for Ontario, in which a physician's license had been revoked for sexual touching, uh, but uh, reduced to a nine-month suspension by both the Divisional Court and the Court of Appeal. And in Verishak, number 1170, these, are, these both involve medical doctors. Again, we have sexual touching used as a therapy and the uh, revocation of a license to practice and the Divisional Court reducing that to a nine-month suspension. So the technique uh, is uh, for you to follow when you're involved in the hearing is no different from what you do when you're in a trial. Uh, keep the appeal or the judicial review in mind all the time you're appearing. Uh, this is your first chance to make the case. If the tribunal is rude, don't be rude back, but uh, that will be in the, in, your, in the affidavit that's made afterwards. <laughs> Somebody said in an earlier paper, try to make your guy look good. Yes, try to look good yourself and try to make your guy look good. Uh, that's a good idea because all the court knows about it is what is displayed to them either in an affidavit, normally in an affidavit or in a transcript. And uh, what is said uh, is extremely important. You can wink while you're saying it, but nobody will see the wink uh, when they're reading it in the Court of Appeal. Um, you're on trial as counsel to a greater extent than you are in a trial, I think. Uh, your improper conduct will be held against you uh, in ways that uh, the court uh, is not likely to disclose. And the reason is that they don't like the uh, spectacle of lawyers uh, appearing to uh, uh, take advantage of lay tribunals. The, the courts don't like it. Uh, one doesn't, you shouldn't worry about that, nobody would like it. But there's a temptation there that some of us over the years have not been able to resist. <laughs> and uh, it might be held against you, and as I say, all the courts don't say it, they might possibly uh, keep it in mind when they're considering your client's case, not, not, not just your antics. Um, you can't take advantage of judges at trial because the judges are taking advantage of you, but uh, with uh, lay tribunals, of course, we can't assume that's going to be uh, correct. Secret of success, I've already given you at least uh, eight uh, tips there, but uh, keep the tribunal strictly within its jurisdiction. Um, take a look at um, what it is that establishes its jurisdiction because the court will not uh, be uh, very tolerant of uh, of procedural or jurisdictional errors, uh, especially where they're looking around for an opportunity to find against, to, to, inter, to intervene. And so as in such cases I've given you, if they don't follow their own rules strictly, uh, the uh, court might very well use that as a basis for intervention. And you've got to know that they've got rules before you can uh, even advance that argument. Basically, you should treat the court, the reviewing court, like a jury. Juries hate unfairness and are quick to punish it, and to a lesser extent, so are courts. But bear in mind that when you're arguing procedural inadequacy or error or unfairness or lack of natural justice, bear in mind that judges have no special expertise in recognizing or defining justice or incompetence. So you're entitled to think of the court as a jury and treat your judicial review or your appeal um, as if you were presenting it to a jury rather than to a group of administrative law judges. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure for me. Uh, I'm sorry to have detained you a few minutes more than I intended, um, but that beautiful weather out there is ready to welcome us both, unless Susan is here. Is Susan here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, welcome to Susan.
I always love it when a, when a speaker says, well, I really can't tell you how to win cases, and then proceeds to go along and give you a dozen hard, concrete ways to do exactly that. Um, yes, Susan is here. Um, Susan is a civil litigator in Toronto practicing with Goodman and Carr. She is the past coordinator of the National Association of Women in the Law, been active in legal reform issues for the Attorney General, has an um, a, um, in-depth professional interest in matters of sexual assault, has spoken on this subject matter for doctors, lawyers, ministers, religious institutions, corporations, and the government. She's harassment counsel for the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education and handles litigation against persons, uh, for persons who have uh, been the subject matter of that activity. Susan, thank you very much. This is our wrap-up speaker for the day. As usual, I can't reach the microphone. Um, can everyone hear me? We have heard today largely from counsel who defend professionals accused of wrongdoing and the disciplined counsel who prosecute them. We have not heard, however, from counsel who directly represent plaintiffs and complainants. Importantly, more and more victims of abuse at the hands of professionals complain that the system does not give them a voice. Consequently, they perceive that the system, be it a discipline hearing or a criminal proceeding, is not accountable to them or responsive to their needs. An example may be found in the disciplinary proceeding before the College of Physicians and Surgeons. Can I you, Susan, for Certainly. Uh, this program is being videotaped, and the net result is that you can't be seen by the camera. It may not be a bad thing. <laughs> Thank you. While disciplined counsel are charged with prosecuting delinquent count doctors, the complainants have no direct control over these proceedings. Indeed, under the present regime, they do not even have standing in the process. Rather, they are mere witnesses. As a result of the dissatisfaction voiced by many complainants, Bill 100 to the Regulated Health Professions Act has incorporated a provision which, if passed, will provide complainants with the opportunity to request standing or intervention status, which, may then, which then may or may not be granted by the tribunal. We have already received some concerns from victims of abuse that even if they are granted standing in a disciplinary proceeding, they might not be able to afford legal counsel to advocate on their behalf. Perhaps the complainant's only real chance at personal redress and accountability from professionals who abuse their power and authority is provided by the civil justice system. At least under that mechanism, the complainant, complainant or plaintiff has more direct control over the proceedings. Financial flexibility is also more available due to the option of a legal aid certificate, an option often not available in an, in an administrative proceeding, or the option of a deferred fee arrangement, or potentially a class action under the new legislation with the knowledge that the defendant either has substantial personal assets, is covered by an insurance policy, or the possibility that you may have an institutional defendant. It is incumbent on counsel to be creative in phrasing the pleadings and structuring the lawsuit in a civil litigation claim against a professional. In the context of a claim against a professional, it is possible that you can attach a claim to the, to the professional's institutional employer or professional association, a possibly that usually does not exist in criminal or disciplinary proceedings. This is still a fairly new area of practice, particularly as it relates to breach of trust or fiduciary duty, sexual assault, and harassment-based complaints. I will address my comments concerning the structuring of a civil lawsuit in this context. In the situation involving a perpetrator who is a professional and claims of sexual abuse or harassment, you are likely in a situation involving a breach of trust and concurrent criminal and or disciplinary proceedings. As a plaintiff's litigator, you must determine whether it is in your client's best interest to embark on yet another legal proceeding. 
you must balance this against the possibility that your client's limitation period could expire before the conclusion of the criminal or dis disciplinary proceeding. With respect to the professions, there are special limitation periods which apply and which are shorter than the usual four to six year limitation period provided by Ontario's Limitations Act. There is, however, proposed legislation which will elim eliminate limitation periods in cases of sexual assault perpetrated in the context of a breach of trust relationship. The Ontario Court of Appeal, in two recent decisions, held that the Limitations Act is a statute of general application which applies to specific limitation provisions contained in other statutes. The Court of Appeal in Martin v. Lestowell uh, Memorial Hospital held that Section 647 of the Limitations Act, which in turn provides that the limitation period does not begin to accrue until a person reaches the age of majority or is of sound mind, postponed the commencement of the limitation period prescribed in the Health Disciplines Act. Similarly, one could argue by analogy that the proposed changes to the Limitations Act pertaining to sexual assault in breach of trust situations will similarly supersede the specific shortened time limitation periods contained in particular acts governing professionals. Furthermore, one must take careful note of the recent Supreme Court of Canada decision rendered in KM versus HM. In that case, the Supreme Court of Canada held that the doctrine of reasonable discoverability told the Ontario Limitations Act until such time as the plaintiff was psychologically able to bring forward a lawsuit. That is, until she is capable of recognizing the causal connection between the subsequent damages she suffered and the abuse. In effect, that decision appears to create a presumption in, the, in, the, uh, in favor of the plaintiff to the effect that a survivor, until a survivor has entered into some form of psychotherapy, the limitation period will not commence. That decision is important because the doctrine of reasonable discoverability was extended in recognition of the psychological complexities facing a survivor of sexual abuse when the perpetrator is a person who stood in a fiduciary relationship. Similarly, it is well entrenched in Canadian case law, I would submit, that the relationship of most, if not all, professionals with, with their respective clients is fiduciary. Ultimately, the safest course is to initiate your civil proceeding in order to preserve your cause of action, with the expectation that if there are concurrent criminal proceedings, your civil proceeding will likely be temporarily stayed or delayed pending the outcome of the criminal proceeding. A stay will likely be requested by defense counsel to prevent a situation whereby the Crown might obtain the benefit of pretrial disclosure through the examination for discovery process prior to the criminal trial. Furthermore, if the criminal proceedings are successful, it obviously makes the liability issues in your lawsuit a lot less contentious. I caution you, however, to very carefully review the allegations proved or admitted in the context of criminal proceedings, as they often do not include the complete course of misconduct. Crown attorneys will often take the, strong, the strongest incidents of abuse and lead evidence on those areas only. Furthermore, if the professional enters into a plea bargain, it is possible that some of the relevant charges which would corroborate the allegation in your civil proceedings will have been compromised. Another significant matter to take note of when you have concurrent criminal proceedings is the impact of a criminal sentence upon your client's ability to, to collect punitive damages. Generally speaking, a criminal conviction negates the possibility of punitive damages. However, in the case of B.A. versus J.I., Madam Justice Veet of the Alberta Queen's Bench held that since the concurrent criminal proceedings in a sexual assault case did not cover all of the incidents of abuse, that the mechanism of punitive damages was still available to the plaintiff in, in civil proceedings. As civil litigation counsel, you will want to establish a good rapport with the prosecuting Crown attorney in a criminal proceeding or with discipline counsel in a disciplinary proceeding 
to ensure as much as possible that inconsistent theories of the case are not advanced. You can also provide a great service to your client and also be of assistance to the Crown or Disciplinary Council by educating and preparing your client with respect to the other proceedings. In structuring the civil lawsuit, after checking the relevant limitation period, you must determine who the, defend the appropriate defendants are. In a situation where the perpetrator is a professional, such as a teacher, you can cast the, the net very broadly. In a teacher scenario, you will want to add as defendants, in addition to the teacher, the school board, the school, and perhaps the government as represented by the Ministry of Education as secondary perpetrators. If you have a claim against the doctor and the abuse took place in the hospital, you will want to add the hospital and again the government, this time as represented by the Ministry of Health. The causes of action which you should canvass in considering civil claims against professionals based on sexual assault or harassment are assault and battery, intentional infliction of mental suffering, the tort of intimidation, breach of fiduciary duty, breach of contract, and negligence. You should also review the relevant codes of ethics or professional conduct in determining whether a private law duty of care giving rise to evidence of negligence exists. The issue of institutional liability is a new area, particularly in the context of civil sexual harassment and assault claims. With respect to institutional private defendants, such as professional organizations, you should canvass occupier's liability, vicarious liability, negligence, breach of contract, and fiduciary duty. One of, the, one of the potentially most promising areas of attaching liability to institutions for damages resulting from the intentional misconduct of professionals is that of vicarious liability or the doctrine of respondeat superior. Traditionally, while there have been circumstances in which employers have been held liable for the intentional tortious conduct of employees, it has been restricted in a way which has been prohibitive to most plaintiffs in sexual assault cases. However, in line with the expanding theories of liability against institutional defendants, a theory has been recently developed and applied successfully by the Supreme Court of California. Particular note should be made of the decision of Mary M. versus the City of Los Angeles, a decision of the Supreme Court of California rendered in 1991. Briefly, a woman who was raped by a police officer brought forward a personal injury action against the city which employed the officer. The trial court found in favor of the plaintiff. The Court of Appeals subsequently reversed the decision. The Supreme Court, however, returned the trial verdict and held that the city may be held liable on the theory of respondeat superior when an on-duty police officer misuses his authority by raping a woman whom he has ostensibly detained. On the facts of the case, Mary M. was pulled over by a police officer for drinking and driving. He detained her, but rather than taking her to the police station, he took her to her house and raped her. He threatened that if she did not submit, he would arrest her. The city of Los Angeles was held liable in damages in the sum of $150,000. The court stated that there are three principal rationales underlying the doctrine of respondeat superior. First, would a finding prevent recurrence of the tortious conduct? Second, would a finding provide greater assurance of compensation for the victim? And third, would a finding of liability ensure that the victim's losses would be equitably borne by those who benefit from the enterprise that gave rise to the injury? The Supreme Court applied those principles as follows. The tortious conduct fell within a risk which was fairly regarded as typical or broadly incidental to the enterprise undertaken by the city, insofar as the city vested police with broad public powers which were misused by the police officer. Hence the city, not the victim, should pay for the folly of their employee. Secondly, it would be of public benefit to require the city to take proactive, preventative measures to prevent this type of abuse of power by police. Third, the cost of the abuse of power by a police officer, when put into that position of power by the state, 
should be borne by the state because of the substantial benefits that it derives from the lawful exercise of police power. I believe that this type of theory is one to which Canadian courts will become more and more amenable in an effort to curtail the abuse of power by defendants, such as professionals, who are in fiduciary positions. This will further the social objective of spreading the responsibility for prevention of such abuse of power amongst the professional associations and institutions which are charged with regulating or judging the conduct of professionals. Another potential area of institutional liability is found in occupier's liability. There is precedent in Canadian case law for holding an occupier liable for the intentional assault by an invitee towards another invitee. This liability has been developed traditionally in the context of the barroom cases where an intoxicated customer attacks another patron. This theory would be relevant, for example, in a case where a professional works in a building owned by a law firm or at a hospital, for example, provided, of course, that the misconduct took place on the premises. Canadian case law has established that an occupier, defined as a person who has possession and control over property, owes a duty of care towards invitees whom it knows are coming onto the premises to become aware of the potential dangers there and to remedy those dangers. While there is currently no reported Canadian case law which establishes what foreseeable harm will constitute uh, in establishing, for example, the standard of care in civil sexual assault or harassment cases, it is possible that the courts may require the occupier to ask questions of, for example, an employee regarding his or her sexual past and to ensure that a comprehensive system is in place to deal with prevention, quick reaction and redress when a sexual assault occurs. This type of theory may be useful in determining, for example, the liability of the church for sexual assaults by priests, where the priest may not be technically characterized as an employee or agent within the meaning of vicarious liability. Another scenario may involve the sexual assault at a school of a student by a guest lecturer who, again, may not be an employee or agent of the school. In other words, this theory may be useful where one seeks to establish liability against an occupier for the sexual assault or harassment of one professional invitee against another invitee. Another potential cause of action is founded in breach of contract. For example, one might imply into a contract of employment as between an employee and her professional employer a duty to provide a reasonably safe environment or a harassment and discrimination free environment based on the existence of the Ontario Human Rights Code. Another example may arise in a student professor situation where the relationship between the student and school is characterized as contractual, such as the duty to provide a reasonable safe environment again. There are in fact cases in the realm of the nursing home personal injury cases which supports this proposition. Of course, what is reasonable in the circumstances is a question of fact. However, the courts are likely to consider whether the system of work or supervision in place was reasonable with a view to fulfilling this com implied contractual term. In negligence actions against institutions, the usual barrier to civil redress tends to be, again, the foreseeability factor. Traditionally, courts require actual knowledge on the part of the institution or an employer of an employee or invitee being at risk. Vis-a-vis -vis schools, however, the courts have imposed a duty of care akin to the reasonable parent, which in turn may incorporate the fiduciary standard of care. Furthermore, there is case law which has imposed a higher standard of care to persons with, for example, disabilities, acknowledging their particular vulnerabilities. Finally, fiduciary duty is premised on assumptions of inequality, power, and vulnerability. Unlike tort and contract law, considerations of causation, foreseeability, and remoteness of damage do not play a major role. Also, because of its equitable nature, a plaintiff can attract more flexible remedies under breach of fiduciary duty. 
In addition, fiduciary duty has a social and moral agenda which is aimed at preserving the integrity, credibility, and utility of certain relationships based in trust. Such dicta was revealed by Mr. Justice Laforé in the Lac Minerals case, for example. The next thing to consider in assessing your civil claim on behalf of a plaintiff is the various headings of damages which she might recover. With respect to the various tortious causes of actions, the usual personal injury headings of damages will apply, including pain and suffering, mental distress, loss of past and future income, out-of-pocket expenses such as past and future therapy costs, together with aggravated, exemplary, and punitive damages. With respect to the potential contractual theory of liability, you will again be looking at similar headings of damages. However, when we get to the area of fiduciary duty, an area which should be alleged in every claim against a professional involving any type of sexual harassment or assault, a different analysis follows. Of course, fiduciary duty is not a tortious cause of action, but rather arises in equity. Nonetheless, the courts have long applied a notion of equitable monetary compensation and restitution. Furthermore, there is now a substantial body of Canadian case law in which punitive damages have been awarded for a breach of fiduciary duty. The fiduciary duty cause of action offers, however, a couple of benefits over contractual and tortious areas of liability. First, note must be made again of the recent Supreme Court of Canada decision rendered in Norberg versus Weinrib, which I know was discussed earlier today. As you'll recall, the concurring judgment of Madam Justice McLaughlin and LaRue Dubay indicated that because they found a breach of fiduciary duty, they would have increased damages on the same facts from $40,000 to $70,000 in recognition of the fact that a breach of fiduciary duty must be sanctioned more heavily by the courts than the tortious cause of action. Another important benefit which is attached to fiduciary duty is the general observation by the courts that the remoteness of damages defense does not apply. The basic maxim applied in fiduciary duty cases is that the defendant will be responsible for all detrimental effects of the breach, whether or not directly attributable to the breach of fiduciary duty. In addition, of course, costs should be claimed on a solicitor and client basis in these cases. In any event, if anything has been made clear, I trust that it has been the point that we must twist the conventional torts and contractual theories of liabilities to claims surrounding damages arising from breach of a trust relationship, in particular surrounding claims of sexual assault and harassment, where the perpetrator is a professional. In my view, it is necessary that the conventional standards of foreseeability and reasonableness must be reworked to assess different standards for the protection of the relatively vulnerable. In my view, the key for plaintiff's counsel will be to convince the courts that abuse of power and authority on the part of professionals is a general responsibility of the profession in question and not a strictly private one as between the individual plaintiff and the professional. If the professions have a commitment to eradicating the abuse of power by professionals, then the responsibility for the prevention of abuse must be placed on the shoulders of the professional associations. Accordingly, the standards of reasonableness and foreseeability should be expanded to impose heavier obligations on our professional organizations to ensure that they are not placing persons in positions or situations where there is a potential of abuse. The professions must ultimately be required to ensure that there are systems in place to discourage and prevent the possibility of abuse of power taking place in their environment. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, I appreciate you all staying to the end of today. The rewards uh, were obvious. I'd like to thank again our speakers for this section of the program. And I have an announcement, the uh, train for Hamilton leaves in 15 minutes. <laughs>